Hi, I'm Miss Marcy, and you are listening to Conversations with Miss Marcy podcast. If you are looking for watered down conversations, this might not be the podcast for you. I'm just saying. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Miss Marcy, and I am joined by a guest, Mr. Lashadion Shimwell, who is also the city councilman of McKinney, Texas. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. McKinney in the building. (laughs) You are so welcome. I'm glad to have you here. So we are going to talk about a couple of things. Um, First of all, well, I want to invite you to be on this podcast because I found it very interesting that you are the second black person to ever be on the, you know, be voted as the councilman in McKinney. That's correct. That's correct. In the 170 years that this has been a city, I am number two. Mm. Does that make you feel proud? I, I am. I'm very proud. I am very proud and um, glad to, to be a voice and, and to give a voice to those what I want. So it was super exciting. You know, I had a bunch of people that I would never get here and I would never make it. Um, and so uh, I love kicking people in the mouth. Figuratively speaking, because I don't want them to put me on the news and I'm kicking <laughs> people in the mouth. That's right. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right got to clean that up. But, um, yeah. But yeah, it's interesting that you said that because I, um, you know, people, I've heard people say that people told them they weren't going to be this and they wasn't going to be that. And, um, I can't believe that, you know, people would tell people that, you know, nobody never told me that when I was younger, but I've, I've heard people say that. And I think that's just a fucked up thing to tell somebody else's child what they're not going to be, you know? Yeah. And this one more so like, you know, when I was a child and not this was as an adult, mm-hmm. and it's interesting. I had the police, you know? First of all, I was an activist before I got into government. I never thought about it. It wasn't a dream of mine. I didn't take up, you know, poli sci or political science as a kid or none of that. I, I'm from the hood. But I knew right from wrong. And uh, we had a, a big incident in my city where a little girl was slammed and and knee by a, a white officer, slammed and knee the little black girl at a pool party. And so... That's when I, I decided, you know, enough is enough. This is not going to happen in my city. And so, I, you know, I started my activism and, and, and really started to become an activist and, and, and putting together marches and organizing. And so at that point, it kind of opened my eyes that, you know, marching and protesting and doing all these things that I was doing was still falling on deaf ears. Mm-hmm. And that we really didn't have anybody on the inside that was hearing our concerns. And so if they weren't going to change the laws for us, then we had to have somebody at the lawmaking table to change the laws for us. And so uh, as as an activist, that's kind of what piqued my interest. And I finally started understanding, you know, who controls the cities and who controls what. And so I started to attend some meetings. But I said all that to say that I was an activist and the police in my own city didn't want to see me become elected because then I would be the boss of their boss. Mm -hmm. And so I got pulled over one time, literally for nothing, and uh, racially profiled in my city. And the police officer told me, you know, uh, with your background, you'll never be a city council. Wow. This happened two years ago, you know? And so um, that to me was, was, was interesting, but the more interesting thing was how many black people told me I would never change anything and mm. that I would never do anything. And that to me was more shocking and surprising because it's the very people that you're fighting for most of the time that are most critical and negative. Maybe mm-hmm. because they didn't have the drive or the courage to step out on the limb and be the first or the second. But because they don't want to see you be more successful than them. Um, it was very discouraging at times to see my own people. And I expected from the opposition, I expected from the, the, the radicals and the racists and, and the white supremacists, but I didn't expect it from black and, and brown people. Mm-hmm. But it makes me wonder if the reason why they were being so doubtful and negative is that be- because I think sometimes we as black people, we 
feel that we are only entitled to certain positions and other positions we feel like that is the responsibility of other you know other races and stuff like that do you think that might have been a reason wow, that may play a role that may play a subconscious role in a lot of people they play it in mind because mm-hmm. i understand that we come from kings and queens and so when right. you understand and know your history then you know i think um and i get into a lot of detail and get get real deep sometimes but when i look at the music when we talk about the social media the music the reality tv the things that are being uh, perpetuated on our community uh, those things keep us down right and so the things and the messages that they're teaching us, the subliminal messages in there, the, the Drake songs that started from the bottom now here. Mm-hmm. When we teach our kids, we started from the bottom where we're no, where, where we were slaves and now we're free, so we're accomplished. And that's not the case. And so we're, we're misguiding our children because they really believe we started from the bottom and now we're here. But when we teach our children and we teach our communities that no, we come from kings and queens, rulers and emperors, then we still have a long way to go. And we ain't start from no bottom. We started at the top. That's right. We get back to the top. That's right. And I think that's a good point because I don't think that, um, I don't think that a lot of us, you know, keep that at the forefront. I think though, people are starting to kind of be more conscious of that because I noticed I'm hearing more and seeing more people acknowledge the king and the queen and things like that. I, and I think that's a good thing because, I think just for a long time, we always had a struggle mentality and we always felt like it was our um, business to struggle. Like we're not supposed to have the best. We have to struggle first before we do anything. Well, that's a, it's a cycle. You know, some of that is generational uh, and a lot of it is what you see is what you know. Mm-hmm. Um, for, for instance, I, um, I ran my campaign from the projects. I live in the projects in the housing authority and, um, but in, in those projects, I started a business. I started a mentoring program. I was giving back to the community. And I started mentoring these children, these, you know, 30 children that, you know, my program picked up in the project. And what I started to do was pick them up and take them to small businesses, take them to universities, take them to museums, take them out of the city, out of the projects, take them to other places. Because if all they know is the project, then that's all they know. If right. All they see is the project, and that's all they know. And so we have to expose those. We have to expose our children. We have to expose our community to different things. And so that's half the battle right there. It's just, you know, you only know what you know. You only know what you see. So we have to step and, and continue to push our people, like you said. You know, um, they we identify with the struggle because that's what we see. Mm-hmm. You know, and... But we can change the world by changing the mindset of our children. That's why, you know, whether I was a city council member or not, I already told I'm going to change this world because I'm impacting these children every day. You know, when uh, when I was running for office, the most exciting thing for these children that I mentored in, in my program and in the project were when we were driving through the city and my yard signs were in people's yards or on the highway and they could see me and they were so excited. Mm-hmm. And, and that really touched me. Yeah. And so what I did was I went back and I made all of those children their own yard signs. How much more powerful would it be to see their own yard signs in their own yard oh, wow. in their own faces? And and so changing their mindsets and letting them know. I'm teaching kids local government shit I didn't learn to my late twenties and thirties. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I didn't know none of this. Nobody taught us this. It's the best kept secret. And so teach you, I'm gonna change the world by teaching these kids where the power is locally. The power is at the city council. That's right. You know, when the president when the president makes a law, it has to go through Congress and then it goes and may trickle down to the state and it takes that. When I, your city councilman, makes a law, it is it is effective immediately. I affect your everyday life. What your taxes are gonna be, what your trash and, and, and water rates are gonna be. Um, the police chief and the judge who's pulling you over, racially profiling you, those are things that I affect every day. And I never knew it until I was in my late 20s. And, and a lot of people... these children an opportunity. I'm just going to say, a lot, and a lot of people don't know that. 
that's the that's the thing people right. don't understand that but you have to we got to take our you know don't get me wrong it's okay to be in into in, into entertainment and all that kind of stuff but we got to take our mind out of entertainment and all this fun shit and, and pay attention to the the real shit that's really going on around us right right yeah they got to they got to set up they got to set up thinking all we can do is basketball football track and 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 do music mhm and you know, there's a lot that, that we can do here locally and that we have to be engaged and involved in. Um, you know, the most, uh, just think about that. I got seven people on the city council. I'm the second black. But for the, most of the years, it's been all white people, all wealthy white people making the decisions for the whole city. Mm. People who do not understand your struggle. People who have never stood in the food stamp line, who have never had a uh, public education, who, you know what I'm saying? People who do not understand the things that we are going through day to day, making the decisions on behalf of you. There was a point where two years ago we lost our public transportation. Why? Mm-hmm. Because they didn't, they didn't care. It didn't affect them. They didn't know anybody who used it. They're like, well, you know, we only show that 1% of people were using the public transportation. Well, that's 1,800 people. Those 1,800 people needed to get to work or get their kids to child care or get that, but because they don't care, because they don't know. And here's the thing about it, and I, and I don't want to make it seem like they're all bad, right. but like I told you about those kids, you only know what you know. If they've never been in our struggle and in our position, then they don't know it. And so it's not their fault that they don't know, but we got to have equal representation so that people who do know can speak up on our behalf. And that's what I wanted to do and give. Well, I'm proud of you for doing that. Thank you, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you could, you know, I always say you either two, you're going to play two positions. You're either going to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution. And it's obvious right. which one you chose. So, yeah, that's real good. Now. I'm trying. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to uh, get into, kind of touch on this a little bit. So, you um, have been on the city council since, what, November? I've been on the council since May of 2017, so going on two years. Okay, okay. And I understand you, and, and this is public information, so I'm not saying anything that's not already out there, but I understand you had, I would say, you know, you had just maybe like two run-ins with um, the law. Right. And I understand because of that, they are now trying to um, change some things or they're trying to basically change the charter um, to vote right. you, to vote you out. Right. Now, how much of that can you speak on? So, you know, first, first and foremost, like I told you, I'm a black man. So um, running with the law happens all the time, all the time. Mm-hmm. It's almost unavoidable in this country. Um uh, beyond that, I'm a outspoken activist, frontliner. You know, all the way from Ferguson, Missouri, to you know, across this country, I've been putting it down for those less fortunate, um, those without a voice, those being abused by uh, police brutality and others. You know what I'm saying? So, as an activist, I'm, I'm I've always been a target of the police. So, uh, my arrest record is, is super long. So, you know, let's just you know, make sure that we are keeping in perspective, you know, what it is for a black man, especially a, a speaker and a leader in the black community, to have run-ins with the law. Right. Dr. King probably saw the jail cell so many times. And I don't um, liken myself to Dr. King because um, I'm just not that great of a person at this time in my life. Plus, I'm not a non-violent speaking person. I'm a Second Amendment know your rights, carry your gun, arm yourself, defend yourself person. So, um, but I say that to say, yeah, I've had some run-ins with the laws in my own city. So where they've tried to slander my name, they've tried to uh, run my name into the mud and basically try to discredit me. But Mm -hmm. we've known this tactic since the 60s when J. Edgar Hoover um, wrote the memorandum for the Black Panthers that they would uh, uh, eliminate and neutralize any black leader by way of discrediting them and, and making them um, uncredible. And so they've tried to do that. Now, what we do see, and this is white supremacy at its finest, is that 
every time we start to understand the rules and understand the game and understand how to play the game, they try to change the rules um, up under us. Right. And so now that I'm elected and I actually have a voice that matters, that I'm actually giving changes. This is one thing to be screaming in the streets and making noise trying to bring light to a situation. That's always needed. But to actually have someone at the table that can now take that information and, and, and make laws that are conducive for the black, brown, and poor communities is a whole nother ballgame. And now that I'm in, they want, and they're doing everything in their power to try to change the rules. And let me explain this to you. They told me before I got elected when I was running for office that if I won, that they would do this. This was a threat that they gave me before I even got elected. So the fact that they are now trying to say, you know, that I got arrested or I had a speeding ticket or I had a dispute with my the, the mother of my children, that they're trying to use that to remove me because they could not beat me. Because when they put a candidate against me, I wore them out. So now that they're trying to do exactly what they told me they were going to do, that is white supremacy at its finest. Wow. And so actually at the meeting when they proposed it, I told them if we're going to change the rules, we might as well make it whites only. We know that's what it's all about. Yeah, I saw that, and that you we said that. don't have to worry about all the nonsense. So man, this is something that they try, and this is how they discourage black people from running. This is how they discourage black and brown people from taking these positions. Now, mind you, this is a free position. I don't get paid for this. I make $50 a meeting. Not like other city councils or places around the world. In Texas, they have a structure of white supremacy because the average person, like myself, who has to work every day, cannot afford to do this job. Mm -hmm. So I put myself in debt and I ran so that I can give a voice and do something that the typical person will not do because they cannot afford to do it. Because the time that it takes to run a city, the meetings that I have to take, the places that I have to be where I'm away from work, I am not getting paid for. So when they threaten to remove me from office, they're not doing me any harm. They're showing me their hand. They're showing me exactly what I already knew. They are showing me exactly who I already knew that they were, which was white supremacy and hell that just give me more time to be with my family and to be at work and to provide for my children but i'm also not going to let them run me out of anywhere i ain't going to let them fear tactics or any of that shit scare me and that's what scares them because through it all i smile my voting record is impeccable anybody has anything to say about me i've never missed a city council meeting and my voting record is impeccable. So what are you trying to remove me for exactly? Right. If it's not because I'm black. I mean, because a speeding ticket is just so, I mean, come on. Like, it's just so minor. Who the hell pull, gives a fuck about a speeding ticket? If you, pull up a, <laughs> if you pull up my speeding ticket, you will see that I was on every news station for a month and a half, two months straight. That was the best they could do to smear my name for two months. Every newspaper, oh my goodness. Well, you know what it pissed them off? It pissed them off because I told them I was racially profiled. And mm -hmm. you know, through all of those news articles and all of those videos, even though they try to release a video of me going off on the officer to try to humiliate me and discredit me, what they did not show you and what they cannot show you is me speeding or committing a crime. What? You mean to tell me, mm -hmm. is this body camera footage, the dash cam footage, the, where's the radar? Where is the video of me actually speeding or committing a crime? They can't show you that because it didn't happen. But this is how white supremacy works. They don't need it to happen. They don't need it to be true. They just need to run the story enough to smear my name enough to put enough doubt in people that they second guess voting for me. And that's the plan is trying to keep me um, just trying to minimize my voice. Mm, 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 that don't make no sense. It's crazy. But you but, gotta be mentally prepared, mommy. You gotta be mentally prepared when you're fighting a system that's been around for 400 years. Right, right. Because when I saw the story, I'm like, they really, I mean, a speeding ticket? I've gotten a speeding ticket. I mean, but I understand too, you know, with your position, do you feel like because you are in this position and because you are a black man, you do have to 
walk on eggshells because you're being looked at. I feel like, I do. I feel like there's several things. I feel like one, my voice was kind of muted because I was an activist out in the streets yelling at the top of my lungs and I had a voice. But then when I took this position, I understood that my position was more important. And so I had to move a little differently. I had to move slightly differently. So my mother always told me if your benefit is greater than your sacrifice, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's times where I don't want to get up and do the Pledge of Allegiance. But if the benefit is greater than the sacrifice, so I'm benefiting, it's bigger than me. The pressure and the amount of pressure that I have, my other council members couldn't imagine. They don't have the same pressure. Their position is typical. I'm a white male. I'm privileged. I've, I've, we've always had these seats. There is nothing expected so much of them. Mm-hmm. Whereas the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I have an expectation from the black, Hispanic, minority, poor community. They expect me to change things. They expect me to make things better for them. And I have to walk in that. And when they shame me, they're not just shaming me. The community is saying, man, you're making us look bad. Mm-hmm. You're getting arrested. We voted for you. You're making us look bad. And so how do how is my position going to affect the next black person that runs? Because they're going to try to use me as, as an example of why they shouldn't vote for them. So the system is so set up to try to make me look bad to keep you from being a future city councilman, to keep the next one from thinking about running for it. But I'll tell you what, if, if they gave anybody, it's the same thing as being pulled over. The statistics show blacks and whites commit the same crimes at the same rate, you know, nonviolent crimes anyway. So, um, but if you're targeting black people more, then you're going to find uh, and arrest them more. If you're only pulling over minorities, mm-hmm. then the crime statistics looks like only minorities are doing it. But that's only because you're only targeting them. Right. And so because so much scrutiny is on me, then I have to walk and try to be perfect. I've never said that I was perfect. I've never thought that I was perfect. But if the same scrutiny was on any other council member, they could have the same issues. But it's not. And so it makes me look like I'm a bad guy. Right. Because I, I'm quite sure those other, you know, the other members on the council are, are having issues as well or just you know there things are going on in their world too but it's just not being reported right now well, and you know when you know somebody you know somebody is different you know ways that they treat people differently right now the other um incident you had it was an alleged domestic incident now the reason i want to touch on that is because you know with everything going on nowadays with um you know acts um against women I think that that was that was like one of the most critical that they really wanted to try to use against you. Right. So with that situation, I understand that was involved in your your child's mom, correct? Right, right. I mean, domestic violence is not cool, first and foremost, at all. You know, um, but understanding that people that really deal with these issues, you got some people that deal with them just because they're fucked up. But then you got people that people in poverty have problems because they're surmounted with other problems. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it's just it's it's stressful. It's a high stress situation to be in. And when when you don't have food or you can't provide childcare or you don't have transportation and you don't know how you're going to get to work and then you don't know if you lose that job because you can't get to work on time what you're going to do with your kids. It's a stressful situation. However, um, this situation was not that. You know, this situation was me trying to help the mother of my children um, with her transportation needs, and she decided to really fuck over me. I decided that she was going to, um, you know, take my vehicle and and not, um, and not pay for it. So once she got her money, I tried to be a good person and help her with transportation and once she got her money she decided that she didn't want to do the right thing and pay me for the vehicle and decided not only was she not going to pay me for the vehicle but she wasn't going to give me the vehicle back and i should just charge that up because i'm a city council member and if i don't charge it up it's going to make us look bad 
interesting. So people will hold your position over you sometimes. Well, I'm going to fuck over you because you're a city councilman. And if you really, you know, take it, if you really take it there, it's going to look bad on you. And it happens all the time. Well, you better not raise your voice at me because you're a council member. Or you better not argue because you're a council member. You better not do this. And so it was really, really uh, spiteful for my ex to do that. She was really upset that um, that I'm I, I'm in a relationship with somebody else and that I've moved on with my life and that I'm no longer in the project and that I'm doing better for myself and she is not. And so she went out her way. She, I have the messages where her telling she's gonna she's gonna end my career. She's gonna ruin my life. She's gonna do this and do that. And so at the end of the day, uh, you know, it happens. It happens. And people have relationships and bad relationships. And that's why we're no longer in a relationship. I left that relationship two years ago because I, it was a hostile situation. But people sometimes can't let go. And I'll be okay. But my children have to deal with the rumors and the innuendos and and insinuations. And my son, who is my junior, when you when you drag my name through the mud, he has to grow up. And you're dragging his name through the mud. And it's just very unfortunate. Um, very unfortunate. But this too shall pass. And what I try to understand is, you know, what does my personal life have to do with my ability to make great decisions on behalf of a city and a community. And so it's a thin line trying to separate the two. On one instance, they tell me when I get pulled over by the police and I tell the police officer to call the chief that at that point I am giving orders as a council member. So there's no separation between council member and and. They're, they're trying to make it where there's no separation between council member and, and, and male and, and just being a man when I'm getting pulled over by the police. Um, but then when I'm in situations like this, there is still no separation. There, there's no private life and, and then city council life or any of that. So it's kind of tough. They tell me that, you know, when I'm getting pulled over, I'm, I'm still a city council member, so I don't have any rights or something like that. And then when I'm having issues at home, I'm still a council member, so I don't have, uh, I, I gotta be perfect or something. So I'm just trying to figure all of that out. They use the rules to benefit them. And um, I feel like I'm just running on and on, but there's a lot to be said. There's so much to say. And um, I, I don't think maybe not in a 30 minute podcast that we can really get into all that is going on because I'm a target of, of lots of things and the sacrifices. We talk about sacrifices that people don't see. Mm -hmm. um, when I go fly for a city business, I can't even get on an airplane. I can't even get my tickets because they've labeled me uh, a, a, a black identity extremist because I want better for the black community. And so when I travel, I have to go hours ahead of time because they're searching and going through all my things. Mm -hmm. And then I got the news and the media all in my face all the time trying to make me look bad. And then I got people who don't know me who are talking about me online and, and running my name through the mud. And I do all this for free. Right. I do all this for little of nothing. I do all this for people and for the very people that I do it for who turn around and talk bad about me and, and spit in my face. And, and I'm the only person doing this to make a difference in the community and the fact that my community hasn't rallied around me in, in a big way yet to say that we support him and we understand the tactics is, is a bit discouraging but I know the God that I serve and the power that is in me and that I ain't going nowhere I ain't gonna let nobody run me off the block so let them change the rules but it's gonna backfire on them so about that changing of the rules. They want to change the charter. Right now, it's 15% of, of all registered voters in the city to do a recall election. And the recall election means that oh, they want to do, they want to hold another election and see if they can vote somebody else in and vote me out. For all my listeners, them changing the charter is actually the first time in ever, ever in history that they've ever tried to do that, right? Right, so this is the first time that they're trying to do it. I, uh, I'm not sure. Um, this is the first time that I know about. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I, I've never seen it done where they try to change the charter for this part. Um, so, um, 
Like again, it's fifteen percent of all registered voters. We have one hundred and four thousand registered voters, so it's roughly fifteen to sixteen thousand people, and they have thirty days to get this petition. So they have to get sixteen thousand people to sign a petition in thirty days to do a recall election. And you do this because you're not supposed to be able to just recall an election because you don't like the result. Right. Because your guy didn't win. Because your guy didn't win, you wanted to have another election. That's not how the rules are supposed to be. So it's set up this way. And you would think that if I'm such a bad guy and I'm rep- representing the city in such a bad way that we have 200,000 people in our city, that it would be easy enough to get 16,000 signatures out of 200,000 people if I'm doing such a bad job. However, they could not succeed in doing so. So now they want to change the rules and make it to where they would need a minimum of 1,000 people. That's it. 1,000 people in a city of 200,000 people. So that's 1% to have a recall election. So it is, they want to change the rules to make it um, I think 10% or 30% of people who voted in that election. So I think we had 12,000 people vote for the mayor. So it would take mm-hmm. 3,000 people. And if you have people less than that, let's say we had 3,000 people vote in my election, then it would take a minimum of 1,000 people to start a recall election. And that would have another election, I would be out of my seat in the interim time until we could have another election. Here's the flip side to that. If they do that, it's going to backfire on this. If they do that, I got 5,000 people in my city easily. We will recall every city councilman, including the mayor, if they try to do, if they do it to me, we will do it to them. Right. Because it's re- because it's ridiculous. It is. And they think that they're going to affect me, but they're going to affect every other city councilman ever going forward, and they don't even realize it. Wow, it's deep, man. That man, politics. I tell you. But that's white supremacy, mm-hmm. and I'm not saying that my city council members are white supremacists, but that's the system, and that's what they know. Mm-hmm. Right, and so whenever. We start to even out and level out the playing field. They try to change the rules. It doesn't get more blatant than this. Right. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I've never heard of, you know, a charter being changed just because y'all want to get somebody out because y'all can't just kick them out the way y'all want to. So now y'all want to try to go back and revise the law to make it happen. Right. They're not trying to change the law to get Trump out of office. Okay. You know, if you look up Ken Paxton, uh, the, um, Attorney General of the state of Texas is under indictment, has been under indictment for two years for um, federal financial fraud or whatever, something dealing with. They're not trying to change the laws and the rules to get him out of there, but both of them are white. The only thing that I can see is they're trying to change the laws to get me out of there. Right. It's like, and it's like they're doing like a desperate cause for desperate measures. Like, oh, we gotta, we gotta just, we gotta do something to, <laughs> It's crazy. It's insane. But instead of them letting me run my course, I'm elected to four years. Two of those years are almost gone. Mm-hmm. So let me run my course and then get me out of there. But no, they can't They can't stand it every month I show up and I'm at every meeting. They can't stand it. It eats them up. It eats them up because they don't feel like that, that, I'm in the, that I deserve to be there like right. they deserve to be there. Right. They don't feel like I'm qualified to be there, like they're qualified to be there. So it eats them up. These are the things that other. These are the things that they don't have to deal with. These things. They don't have these pressures on them when they're elected. They'll never understand what it's like to be black in America, trying to do the right thing. You know, I could be out on the streets, uh, trying to get it by any means, mm-hmm. but I'm not. And this is how you handle it. This is how you treat it. Well, you certainly have a great attitude about it, and you know. You are walking with your head up, you know, in spite of, and um, that's that's good to see because, like you said, I mean, you knew what you signed up for as right. a as a black man, I you know. Mean, I mean, I, you know, you know it. You know, you got to be mentally prepared to do it, but you know, you really don't know the extent and the depths that that they'll go to when you do it. Like 
you, I expect a little trash talk. I expect a little this, a little that. But and I have people just flat out lie on me, try to put false cases on me, um, just make up stories. You know, it's just it's insane. You don't mm-hmm. know the depths that people will go to, the the hate that people have, people that don't know you because of the color of your skin, and these things still exist. And that's what they're that's what they're upset about. They're upset because I'm exposing things that happened in our city, that mm-hmm. happened with our staff, that happened with our police officers, that happened every day. And they don't want to wear that we were ranked the number one best place to live. But go look up the McKinney Pool Party incident and see how that affects because they don't want a black eye on the city and that's what they seem to think that I am because they want to cover up all the shit that's happening here. Excuse my language, but I can only just be real about about everything. And, um, you know, I can say it's all peachy because I don't want to discourage other people. It's a job that has to be done. But, um, you know, you sacrifice family time, you sacrifice finances, you sacrifice the sacrifice that you have to be willing to give um, on behalf of your community for the greater good of other people. And I just want to say I'm proud of you. I'm proud that you uh, are giving me a voice and other people a voice and yourself a voice because I, we don't have that. We don't have the media outlets. We don't have, you know, when, unless when I call them, unless it's something controversial, they don't want to talk about it. They didn't air me when I got elected as a second black um, council member. They wanted to put me on the news because I was a senior council member. They didn't want to air me because of the things that I'm fighting for, trying to get equal pay to to our city workers who are paying less than t- who are getting paid less than ten dollars an hour. Right. They work for the city, and the average house in our city is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. But you're paying people that work for the city less than ten dollars an hour. They don't want to give me a voice to talk about those things. When we just gave the city manager a forty thousand dollar raise last year, but we can't give our hourly of employees a four dollar raise to get them at a living wage. We don't have the outlets to really have a voice. And so I appreciate you giving me that outlet um, here today. I am because you are. I didn't get here alone. It's because the people that get the thousands of people that got out and voted for me. I am because you are. I am because they are. And we are all we got. No problem. And, and you know, you can, you're welcome to come on here anytime. You know, and I appreciate you telling your story. You know, um, at first I was like, you know, I don't know, you know, if he would want to talk about this or not. But, hey, you know, and I'm glad you did. What happens to the best of us? Listen, we got we to gotta own our mistakes. We have to um, be truthful about things that are going on and realize that, hey, we, everybody struggles. Mm-hmm. We're going through something. And um, take it for, you know, don't take it for face value, but, you know, just look at the picture as a whole. Um, yeah. Most people don't want to talk about their, their downfalls and shortcomings of those. But those are the things that make us great and, and build character in who we are. Um, I love my people. I love I love you out of Texas and back. And we just talked about how big of a state it is. So that's a lot of love. But um, we got a lot of work to do. I need you guys. And you need people like me in positions that are making changes for us. That's right. And we are going to end right there. Councilman Shimwell, thank you so much for joining me today. All right, guys, that's it for today's podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe and follow me on social media. All right, take care.